Okay, a very, very good morning to you all and welcome to uh, your second um, HSMA uh, training day. Um, can somebody just give me a thumbs up that they can hear me? Is everything coming through okay? Hopefully it is. Yeah, everything's good. Awesome, thank you. O always good to know you're not talking to yourself. Um, fantastic. So um, today is a little half session um, day um, where basically module two kind of runs a little bit alongside uh, module one and 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 um, today we're really going to be uh, taking you through um some of the software um that you're going to be using predominantly within um within the training and hopefully within your your, your project work because a lot of the stuff that we're going to be showing you um is uh, uh is in in python um and uh in order to interact with python there are certain pieces of software um that you'll need to use um uh, and basically this this is a kind of um an alongside module that that will run alongside the uh the, the main uh the main module so um it's a bit of a mini module there's only two sessions in this module the first is today um and then there's uh, a second one uh, at the end of the month um and that's the only two uh, two times that you'll have um a second session on on the on the thursday um and uh, basically in this module we're going to be talking about the tools that you're going to be using um to to code um the principles of free and open source uh, software development and open science and why we believe very strongly uh, in open science and why we're an open science team and why uh, not only the uh, the fact that all of the software that we teach you is completely free of charge um, but uh, why uh, we believe in free the other meaning of free in terms of uh, uh, freely sharing uh, things that have been done as well um, and we'll talk more about that in the um, in the session at the end of the month um, and also um, uh, collaborative uh, tools and version control which is an important part of um, free and open source uh, development so um, uh, in the uh, second session of this module at the end of the month you will learn all about um, uh, git uh, which is a uh, fantastically uh, uh apparently complicated uh, but wonderfully powerful um uh piece of software that will uh, will show you and guide you through that session um originally last year when we first did a session on git um i tried to do it in three hours uh that did not work um it there's, there's a lot more time so so it will be a full day um session but we will guide you through that and how to use github um beyond obviously you're all using github to download the materials but how you use github properly uh in order to um share uh, development work um, that you're doing and um, we'll talk a lot in that session as well about the the, the principles of um, free and open source software um, and and open science but today's um, session is going to be focused on uh, the first of these um, the tools um, that you're going uh, to use uh, to code so um we talked on on Tuesday about um, uh, coding and about um, uh, programming in, in terms of its sort of broad principles um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the key concepts uh, within within coding. Um, when you come to do it, which you will from next week, uh, so from Tuesday, you'll be um, starting to uh, to write Python code. Uh, you're going to be cracking straight into doing some Python code. You're going to be doing a little bit today, um, but you're going to be doing a bit of code a little bit blind um, because we haven't taught you yet how to do this stuff um, but you're going to get a little glimpse of it and have a little play around with it um, but whenever you write computer code um, technically you could write your code in any text editor you could open up notepad on windows and write your code um, and then get the uh, uh the python compiler to, to then compile the code and and, and, and uh, run the code that's not a very good way to do things um it's far better uh to use uh, something called um an integrated development environment uh which is commonly abbreviated to an ide and basically an ide is a, a piece of software that basically provides lots of tools and assists that make um the process of coding a more friendly uh, process so um, it'll include things that allow you to more easily um, debug your code, which is checking for errors, basically, in your code. You'll come to loathe debugging, as, as all coders do. If you're new to coding, um, just, just, just wait, because uh, debugging is what you'll spend 90% of your time uh, doing, unfortunately. <laughs> um, 
you're also able with this the, this kind of software to be able to kind of interrogate your program live. That's an important feature of Python that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and one of the uh, principal reasons why it's used for um, uh, for scientific uh, programming as, uh, as what you'll be doing essentially. Um, and uh, you can automatically identify uh, what we call syntax errors, which is um, uh, the best way to think of a syntax error in code is it's a bit like a spelling mistake. Um, it doesn't understand what you're trying to say. Um, so it's a bit like a spell checker for, for coding. Um, and that's quite important um, when you're coding. If you could imagine, you know, writing a thousand lines of uh, code in Notepad, and then it just says doesn't work. Uh, and then you have to through and try and work out what, what what what's gone wrong so clearly you want something that that will help you um in that in that process and it'll give you other warnings as well um as you um, as you write and develop your your code now there are there are lots and lots of um ids out there um the the uh, there's things like spider which we're going to show you today um uh which is obviously for python there's r studio which you'll come across um uh, later in the course in the new year uh, when you learn about um r uh, jpyter which we're going to show you today um there's also though um uh, visual studio vs code um which uh, i don't personally use but i know is is um uh, used quite widely in the team and by a lot of people is actually a pretty decent piece of software these days um uh, there's uh, a collab which we'll show you today. Um, uh, something called Idle. Um, there's <laughs> there's also something called Vim. Uh, probably most of you aren't aware of Vim, other than um, in my warning in the instructions about installing Git. Um, Vim is an interesting piece of software. Um, it's uh, what we probably call a very hardcore IDE. Um, it's it's a Linux. Uh, it's based in Linux, although you can get it in other operating systems. Um, it's a very very complicated um uh ide to use so much so um that uh the reaction of most people as they go into it is they can't work out how to exit vim um that's a thing uh, so much a thing that they've written entire books about how you exit this program uh, it is incredibly difficult to use having said that people absolutely swear by it um, uh, I'm not one of those, uh, those people. I've, I've not dared um, dip my toes uh, far into the pool of Vim, um, but uh, some people absolutely uh, love the thing. Um, so just to be aware it's out there. Your only encounter, unless you really want to, to, to um, uh, look for uh, Vim and use it, um, will be if you've uh, forgotten during the Git installation on Windows uh, to change uh, the default uh, text editor, which um, in some sort of, I can only imagine some sort of cruel joke, uh, defaults uh, to Vim, the most difficult to use um, editor in, in the world. Um, so uh, don't worry if you have done that, you'll be able to see in the instructions that there are ways in which you can undo that. Um, otherwise, it'll make the process of learning Git um, an even more uh, uh, challenging uh, experience as you try to work out how you get out of this, this thing that uh, this, this text editor that's running. So uh, just a little uh, further word of warning. So there's lots of um, IDs out there. By no means in this course are we saying you have to use uh, Spider and Jupyter and Colab. That's absolutely not what we're saying. Within this course, we will be uh, supporting. We will we will be using ourselves and um, Spider, Jupyter, um, and uh, and Colab. Um, but if you want to go off, um, maybe you you already uh, have a bit of coding experience, you're already using VS Code, or maybe you're using Vim, um, in which case you can teach the rest of us. Um, but um, if you've already got an ID you like, feel free to use that. Um, if you find as you as you um, get more experience in coding that you try a different ID, you like that, that's fine. Go for that too. Um, but uh, within this course, we're, we're basically showing you um, uh, in these IDs, but they all basically work pretty much in the same way, with the exception of Jupyter, which um, and, uh, and Jupyter and Colab are kind of very similar. Um, and uh, we'll talk this morning about um, why they're kind of unique and what's kind of special uh, about them. Um, but uh, VS Code, I believe, allows you to do stuff in, in Jupyter, in Jupyter notebooks as well. Okay, so these are the core ones we're going to focus on. And obviously, when you come on to the um, the R training, uh, which Simon will take uh, um, next year, um, you'll you'll be using um, R Studio. I think he's using the the, the cloud version um, as well for that. So um, this morning we're going to talk about the three main ones: Spider, um, Jupyter Lab, and um, Jupyter Notebooks via Jupyter Lab and uh, Google uh, uh, Co Laboratory. Um, 
Uh, so we'll look at each of these in turn. And basically, this morning is going to be a lot of you um, in your groups um, playing around um, and, and getting used to this kind of stuff. So for each one, I'll kind of give you a bit of a um, a bit of a quick tour and an overview. Um, but then uh, uh, you've got some exercises where you work through them all together, and you'll be able to play around with and um, explore the different features um, of, of this uh, of each piece of software. Um, so you get lots of hands-on um, time this morning to get used to it, because of course from Tuesday this is exactly what this is the software you'll you'll be using. So um, it's good that you get familiar with the, at least the basics um, today. So um, let's start with um, let's start with Spider. Oh, the other thing I should say, um, I, I know there's a few of you um, who have still uh, are still struggling to get the the software installed with your IT departments. I think most of you have got it on there now. But um, just to flag up, if you haven't got um, that software installed on an alternative PC that you can use, um, when I come onto the Google Colab stuff um, uh, at the end of today you will be able to, unless your IT department has blocked it, in which case I can't help you, but um, you will be able to use Google Colab um, for, uh, as a kind of temporary until you get, uh, uh, until you um, uh, get the rest of the software uh, installed, um, because you can do that, uh, you can use Google Colab just by visiting the website and doing it online, and you don't need to install anything. Um, it has severe drawbacks unless you're willing to pay, um, which is why we don't, um, well, one of the reasons we don't exclusively recommend it the free version is not guaranteed so they could just pull it at any moment um uh so it's it's not something you want to rely on but as a temporary measure uh, it'll work and i'll also show you later how you can um use google colab when i go into the exercises uh from next week and say go into um uh this jupyter notebook and follow this you can, i'll show you how you can do that if you haven't got jupyter installed by that point um how you can upload that to google colab um, and, and do it on there instead Okay, so let's start with Spider. So Spider's um, basically a free and open source FOSS um, IDE, um, and we're going to use that for the majority of the uh, the content on the course. Um, it's an IDE that's been designed by and for scientists, data scientists, and engineers, and that's quite important uh, for what we're doing because um, uh, all of the stuff that you're going to be doing in terms of modeling and data science is scientific computing essentially. Um, and Spider is automatically included with the um, Anaconda distribution of Python, which is the one that we recommend uh, that you install um, and it comes with um, a, a number of useful features which we'll, we'll we'll have a look at okay so um i'll show you spider uh, in the flesh in a moment but let's just have a look at an overview of it first so when you um open your um, anaconda navigator um, and click launch spider um, this is uh, the sort of thing you'll be greeted with, although you probably haven't already written the code. Um, but uh, you'll have this kind of window. Your windows might be in a slightly different position, depending on the version. Sometimes they move things around, but generally this is the default. Um, but you'll be able to recognize the uh, the kind of three main areas. So let's talk about the three main areas. Um, this area, which is usually on the left, uh, and you can resize these and you can move them around um, as well. Um, this is what's known as the editor pane. OK, so um, this is where we write our computer programs. Now, remember um, that when we uh, talked about coding on Tuesday, we said that basically programs are just a list of instructions that the computer follows um, and then executes those instructions one by one. So the code that we write over here won't run until we tell it to run so we just keep writing and it'll, it, it, nothing will happen until we say right now computer i want you to go through and run these instructions and it'll go through and one by one line by line it'll go through and execute um, those those instructions uh, so that's the editor pane so that's where we write basically our, our computer program okay so that's the way you're going to spend most of your most of your time and as time goes on, you'll spend most of your time staring at it, thinking where on earth is this, this error. Um, but uh, th this is where you'll be doing uh, your, your code. Now, this thing down here in the bottom right um, is known as uh, the IPython console, Interactive Python console. Um, now, this is a um, uh, one of the advantages of, of Python. Um, so this is this is where you'll see your um, the outputs uh, from your code. So um, remember on Tuesday, we talked about how there's different ways in which we uh, input into our computer. Um, and then there's different ways in which it provides us with um, output um, to uh, uh, visualize in some way the, the outputs of the instructions. So this is where we'll see text-based outputs. So if we've told it to uh, print some text, 
this is where it'll, it'll appear. And we'll also get little, um, this is where the error messages will appear and various other things, which is, which is great. But another really useful feature of this IPython console is it allows us to write code that executes immediately. Okay, so the I stands for interactive in, in IPython. Um, now, what that means, and this is why it's uh, such an advantage with, with Python, it means that we can quickly test something. Um, we can write a piece of code and it'll um, an instruction and it'll immediately execute that. It, unlike the editor, where we're writing uh, code line by line and nothing happens until we tell it to run, here uh, we can just write a line of code uh, uh, or a simple instruction, uh, push enter, and it'll immediately execute that. Okay, so it allows us to quickly test something, or we can interrogate something in our computer program. So we can run the program and then say, okay, that's that's a bit odd. Something weird happened there. But at all the variables and uh, all the variable values, remember we talked about variable values, all of that information is still in memory. So we can interact with it and we can say, okay, um, what's what's in that variable? Um, uh, try doing this to this this uh, this variable, um, and we can play around with it in an interactive way to see how we might um, uh, how we might fix our code, for example. Um, there's also um, a history tab. Uh, so you see at the bottom here, uh, by default, this is IPython console. You also, there's also a history tab that you can flip that to. That basically contains a recent history of um, instructions that have been run uh, from from this console. And then the third main area, um, which is usually at the top right, um, is uh, this pane here. Um, now, this one, there's there's kind of different uh, tabs that allow you to uh, see various pieces of useful information. Um, the first one that it usually, um, I think it usually defaults to, that depends on your version, but the, the first one here that you'll probably spend most time in um, is uh, also known as the Variable Explorer. Uh, that basically allows us to see a, a list of all of the variables that we've got. Um, so the names of the variables, remember the labels that we put on the boxes, um, what type of variable it is, uh, how big the variable is, um, and uh, the values um, that have been stored within uh, that, uh, that variable. Um, and that can be hugely useful uh, to try when we're debugging to say, oh, hang on, I, I was expecting a an integer value in here. There's a there's a string. What's going on? Something's gone wrong. Um, so it allows us to check that the uh, the stuff in the variables is what we would expect. The stuff it's remembering. Uh, as well as that, there's also um, a plots tab um, that basically allows us to um, if we generate graphs uh, from our code, um, which you'll see later in module one in a few weeks time. We'll show you how to do that. Um, that's where we, they will appear in Spider. Um, so you click on plots and you'll see the, the graphs. Um, there's a help tab, um, which uh, basically if we push control and I in front of an instruction, we'll get documentation about it. So if we say, okay, I want to know how this function works, push control and I, click on the help tab, and it'll it'll give you the official documentation for how you use that function. Um, I don't tend to use that a huge amount because you, Google will essentially do the same thing and usually a more helpful way. But it is uh, nice to know it's it, it, it's there, uh, particularly if it's a, maybe it's a function you used before and you just can't remember how to, um, you know, what, what inputs you need for that function or what the art, particular argument was that you were looking for. And then there's a files tab, um, which basically allows us to explore and view and open files uh, that are in our, our present working directory, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So along the top here, so they're, they're the three main areas. Along the top here, um, we've got uh, a toolbar, which um, basically has lots of useful functions. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these, and you'll explore these gradually over time, and probably most of them you'll never use. Uh, but just to flag off a few key ones, um, so these three uh, over here are, are basically file operations. This will look very familiar to you, I'm sure. Uh, from numerous pieces of software um, where you've got a, a new uh, this this icon to start a new file um, so a, a new python file here a new dot py file um, an open if you want to open one you've already written and a save button um, this green play button here um, that's uh, that's the run button so that's the button that you push or you can push f5 on your keyboard that says okay now computer run all of the stuff i've written in the editor pane and that will just start at the beginning and it'll run through line by line, executing the instructions that you've given it. Um, what you can also do, though, is um, you the, there's uh, various ways in which you can um, run just bits of your code. Um, so it may be that you just want to run 
um, a particular piece of code, maybe you want to run a function definition because this, uh, uh, so that you can play with it in the Python console. Um, so if you just want to run a bit of your code, um, then uh, this one over here, uh, this icon, or you can push F9, basically that says, um, just run a portion of the code. If you haven't selected any code, it'll just run the whatever um, line of code your cursor is on, um, uh, wherever you've clicked uh, in your editor pane, or you can select, drag and select a block of code and it'll run all of that code, but nothing else. So it can be quite useful, but just bear in mind that um, your code may be dependent on other things in your code. So um, it'll only run that bit of code. Uh, so you need to bear that in mind. And then we've got the thing over here, which I mentioned a moment ago, called the uh, present working directory. Um, this basically specifies the current directory in which Python is going to be looking for any files that you're going to read in or uh, or write out to. And um, we'll come on to file reading and writing when we start the Python training, um, how you read in information from other files and how you write out that information. When you give it a, a either a file name, um, that's the directory in which it will be looking for it, or you may give it a path, uh, in which case that's the, um, if it's a relative path, it'll look from that directory. That's basically its home. That's where it, that's where it's um, looking. Um, so you need to make sure usually that's in the directory that you would expect it to be. Now that should, in most cases, default to the directory of your currently open files. So if you've got your, your um, once you've saved it anyway, so once you've written your um, your Python code and you've saved it, that should switch to the, whatever directory you've saved that Python file in. Um, so then uh, that if you put any other files in there, files you need to read in, etc., um, or in subdirectories within that folder, um, then uh, th that should all work fine. But just be a bit careful um, because it doesn't always do that. And it seems to not always do that in Windows particularly. Um, I don't know if it's got better with the with the um, uh, other versions, of, newer versions of Spider, but just something to be aware of. So if you're getting file problems and it says it can't find the file, um, have a look up here just to make sure you're in the right in the directory you would expect to be. That's the directory in which your code um, uh, lives. And so when it executes, that's that's where it's expecting to see things. Okay, so um, did you notice, let's have a flip back if you didn't, let's go back here. There's a big vertical line going down, uh, um, down the uh, side of the editor pane. Um, that line, is a line which indicates a width of 80 characters. Okay. Now, the reason that's there, back in the old days, um, old uh, terminal monitors on really old computers uh, basically had a standard width of 80 characters. Um, and even in the in the really old days, which when I speak to my colleague Mike, he makes me feel uh, a bit young um, because he talks about punch cards. Um, so when you back in the really old days of computing, when you know you had these giant scale computers that were you know pretty much bigger than your house, um, the IBM punch card, essentially would be your your code, um, had eighty columns. So eighty uh, is a standard width historically in in coding. Now, obviously, that we don't use uh, terminal monitors and punch cards these days. But even in, in the modern day, it's actually really good practice to use an 80 character width for your code. And the reason for that is it keeps your code readable. Um, and there's a real danger if you don't do that, that you can end up with really long lines of code that make it very difficult for people to, uh, to follow and, and, and read. And it is really, really bad practice to cross that line. So that line reminds you, don't cross this. Now, Spider will let you, as all IDEs will let you, you, it won't stop you doing that. You can write beyond the line. Um, it's there to make you feel guilty, basically, because it, it'll make your code look horrible because it's got a big line through it. Um, so you can do it, but you really, really shouldn't. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard all the excuses over, over, over time. I've heard, you know, well, it's only a character or two over. Does it really matter? Um, you know, I've got a I've got a really high resolution monitor. I can I can see really long uh, lines of code if I want. So what's the problem? Um, it, it's really good practice. I can't emphasize that enough. And it's if you're new in your coding journeys, now is a good time to get into the habit of not crossing that line. Um, it'll make your code 
far more elegant. It's extremely good practice. Uh, and uh, when other people come to read the code, it'll make it much easier uh, to follow. So it's very important to try and do that. Um, there's ways in which you can cross the line. Um, so you, if you're sat there thinking, well, does that mean I have to, you know, uh, give all my variables really short names so that I don't make my lines of code too long or only write really simple code. No, 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 it doesn't. Um, and there's, uh, you'll see when we do the Python training, there's lots of ways in which you can um, ensure that you can split a line uh, that would be very long over uh, multiple lines. So it doesn't cross that uh, that 80 character, uh, that 80 character border. Okay, I will I will stop uh, talking there, and I'm going to uh, hand over uh, to you um, to have a go at this. Um, so, oh, actually, before I do that, let me let me um, just uh, bring up Spider because I realise I haven't done that. Um, now I'm going to bring it up um, from uh, from my uh, terminal because I'm in Linux. Um, but uh, you will do this. Uh, most of you, I suspect, will be in Windows, and we'll do this from um, Anaconda Navigator. Uh, I'm going to launch my version of Spider here. Um, so you can see it live here. Um, this is the editor window that I that I was talking about. This is where we write our program code. Um, this is our interactive console. Um, and you can see that the, the, here's a history of the uh, things I've, I've, I've done recently. Um, and um, uh, up here, we've got our variable explorer, our help. Uh, it defaults to help, actually, I think, on this version. Um, uh, our plots, which we won't have any at the moment, and various files as well. OK, so um, this is this is kind of your um, uh, uh, your spider environment. And it might, depending on the version, you may have a newer version. It might look slightly different, but the core principles of you've got an editor window and you've got an interactive Python console um, and you've got a, um, a, a, a this window up here, which uh, you tend to use mostly for the variable explorer, but also has the, the plots and files and help as well. Um, that will stand. Okay, so all all of, the, all of these concepts will be um, will be there, um, and you may may have different color schemes to, to have. But the, again, it'll it'll all look um, pretty familiar. So what I want you to do now is um, to uh, go off uh, into your groups, um, and you're going to have a go at uh, using Spider, and you're going to do that by working through uh, some instructions. So there's some um, instructions that I've um, I've put together, which will take you step by step through a, a series of things to do. Um, you're going to work in your groups and um, uh, each of you should work through it as well on your on your own but talk about it uh, or talk about it as a group as you're doing it um you'll see there's lots of bits in the instructions where it says observe what it's doing so talk about what it's what it's doing as a group make sure you're all understanding uh what's going on nobody's getting left behind etc um obviously the, uh, if there are a couple of people that haven't got the software installed you'll need to you'll need to uh, uh, simply follow along uh, at this moment so uh, it would be a good idea uh, for at least uh, for one of you in the group um, to, to share your screen um, so that uh, one of you can, uh, if people are sort of falling a bit behind, um, then they can uh, sort of catch up, etc. as well. Um, and make sure that the last question that you undertake as, as an entire group, you look at that um, together. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, about uh, 40 minutes, or resume about um, at 10.40, just before, um, and have a go at this. And as I say, if you get stuck, um, give us a shout. It's, it's only me here today, Elliot, it's on, on leave today, um, but uh, do give me a shout. But hopefully it's all very uh, self-explanatory. Uh, you'll find the file uh, that you, no, not that, you'll find the file that you need, uh, 2A exercise 1, uh, it's this one here, and as I say, it's all written out for you, uh, what you what you need to do. So um, have fun, uh, and I will put you into the breakout rooms. Any questions, sorry, before I go on? Mm -hmm. um, is, is there any useful shortcuts for running the code or something like that that we should know about? Uh, what, what sort of shortcuts do you mean? <laughs> like, for example, if you've typed a line and you want to just run that one. No? Okay. F9. Oh, okay, F9. Yeah. I think it's in the slides as well, Evelyn. Oh, Apologies. No, so, sorry about that. I, I My Zoom crashed and I got kicked out. Uh, so I'm now, I'm now back. Um, so apologies. Sorry, could you start that question again? I completely, you started talking, then it crashed. <laughs> the, the other answer is F9 to run the code. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so there's, there's there's other stuff like that that you'll find useful as you go along. But for the moment, uh, the main stuff that you'll be doing is, is basically... Um, 
running your code and basically the, the the key stuff that you'll use in spider is the 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 editor pane to write your code um you'll you you'll be using the variable explorer a lot um to try and um interrogate your variable values um and um and that will help when you're trying to work out what's going wrong and you'll get practice doing that in a, mo in a moment um and then the interactive python console to, to kind of interact with it so those are the three main things um but as you come on to get used to debugging and stuff you'll um so we have got a debugging exercise in a few weeks uh, where you'll you'll um, play around with running bits of code and seeing what's going wrong etc as well so Cool. Okay. In which case, I will uh, I will put you in uh, the rooms now. Let's open up the breakout rooms and say we'll resume at uh, ten forty, and I'll float around uh, if anyone needs me. This meeting is being recorded. Hi everyone. Uh, okay, welcome back. Um, so I just wanted to pull you all back. I mean, we were due to anyway, but um, uh, a number of you have found a, a problem, um, and it's absolutely not you. And I didn't realise this was um, an issue. So when you got, uh, not it wasn't open to everyone, but when you got to the um, the very last bit where you were running um, demo two. Um, that uh, your sort of spider would just completely crash. Um, uh, and I started to get a bit worried when I saw people from lots of different groups saying exactly the same thing. Um, so it turns out there is a uh, bug um, in the version of Spider 5.1.5 uh, with the input um, command. Now, that's pretty atrocious um, because uh, prints and inputs are two of the most fundamental building blocks of any programming language. So the fact that you can't do inputs um, and it causes it to crash is 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 pretty bad. Um, so that's quite a severe bug. Now it has been fixed. Um, so uh, and in version five point three point zero, um, it can be uh, resolved. However, I've also just come across something uh, because you're using the Anaconda distribution. Anaconda uh, basically uh, limits the version number that you can go up to because it, it it's it's a distribution. It maintains control. Um, I, I don't know if this has changed. Um, because I, this was reported back on uh, the fifth of April, so I'm hoping um, that that might be um, that might now be resolved. But uh, it is. Uh, I'm going to post a little link into the chat. Um, if you find that you can't upgrade your version of Spider, um, then uh, have a look at the instructions at this top link. It's the first answer um, where it will show you how you can force the update um, essentially, and that will then work. Um, so uh, there's a question on the um, uh, uh, on the chat. Uh, is it uh, Python? No, it's it's actually it's, it's Spider itself. Apparently, is where the bug is, and it's not just with. Uh, I just had a look. It's not just with inputs. It's um, uh, around the file uh, uh, transaction stuff as well. Um, so there's an actual there's an, an error in the IDE, which is really bizarre um, uh, to get so, well around something so fundamental as file inputs and, and uh, user inputs and things like that. that that's that's I've never seen that happen. Um, so if you're getting that, don't panic. Um, most people are getting that. Some people were on um, uh, an older version of Spider and were able to use it or on a newer version um, and it works, but it's that particular version uh, that's causing uh, that's causing an issue. So um, apologies for that. It's uh, <laughs> obviously I, I'm not on that newer version. I'm still on a, a, an older version. So it's 5.3.0. Um, that you'll need. 5.1.5 uh, is the problem one. Um, so if you're getting that issue, you're on you're on that problem um, uh, on that problem version. Um, but uh, try and upgrade it. If you can't update the version, um, then follow the instructions there. But don't panic because I'm about to show you two other IDEs anyway that you can use in the meantime, um, and you can do everything pretty much in there. But it would be good uh, to get that sorted. Um, you'll need to try and sort that by Tuesday. Um, because uh, one of the first things I'm going to get you to do is to do inputs <laughs> and it'll crash. Um, so, and you're also doing file reading and writing. It sounds like that's going to crash as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, do try and upgrade that. Apologies for that. That's um, uh, uh, quite astonishing that that went in unchecked. I'm amazed that nobody noticed that during the, uh, during the testing. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll also do a bit of further digging later um, and see if there are updated instructions on that. But hopefully you'll be able to update it um, 
uh, in which case that will, it's been confirmed, that will solve the issue. Uh, what I will do just very briefly, um, uh, because some, obviously a lot of you didn't see it, um, I will just share share my screen and show you that last bit of code for those that uh, didn't get a, a chance to to see that. Um, just... I've lost audio, Dan. Is that just me? No, I've lost it too. Me too. Me too. Me too. And Dan, I can't hear you. That Dan has possibly lost sound. Yeah, Dan can't hear you. Dan, can you hear us? No, he's busy firing the plane. I don't think he can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited, firing away. Oh my we need God. to message him. I just messaged him, so I think other people are. Cool. He'll pick one of them up. <laughs> well, maybe not. You may have to repeat the whole lecture again. <laughs> I, don't, um, <laughs> I don't know how to get his attention. <laughs> We've tried everything. <laughs> Everybody's putting their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> what if all of us raise our hands? Good question. Where are my hands with all these screens? Well, we can't hear you. <laughs> you have to be called down. Has he got a mobile? What's happening? Has he got? Has he reset himself? <laughs> but, well, reset his machine, not himself, sorry. <laughs> You're seeing it, isn't it? Maybe try to write on Slack on the common room. Maybe you will see it. I think he's seen it. He's, he's seen it. He's disappeared now, I think, hasn't he? I think he's resetting, I think. <laughs> how, many, how many of you guys have just working from your laptop? I mean, I've got two screens and still struggling a little bit. I'm just on my laptop and I have yeah. no access to network because it's too dangerous and I cannot be trusted with the patient data. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, could you hear me now? Is it coming? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, back. you're back. Yeah, we can hear you now. Apologies. Did it just cut out or did you not hear me at all for any of that? <laughs> we <laughs> couldn't hear you. We didn't hear any of that. Okay, apologies. I don't know what's going on. This is the same issue I encountered during the presentation event for those of you that were there. Um, that it just ran. There's some. I think there's a bug in the yeah. uh, version of Ubuntu that I'm using around the sound. There's bugs everywhere. There are. There indeed. There are bugs everywhere. Um, but it seems to be that there's a, a bug in the sound drive, and it's caused a. It seems to have caused a major issue with Zoom, um, which I've updated, and hopefully, uh, I, I assumed that that problem being resolved. So, um, yeah. Do if you if you can't hear me, raise your hands because I'll see that. Um, which is what I what I then started to see. Um, so apologies. That that's. Uh, I'll just check my audio settings now. Yeah, that should all be. Uh, that should all be fine. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, apologies. I'm just saying. Um, basically, I'll. Let me share my screen again. Uh, hopefully you won't. Sorry. This, um, yeah, so um, I was basically just saying this, basically what this code does is it takes random samples 
uh, from uh, a distribution of your choosing, and then the, uh, the, the you choose how many samples. Um, so here I chose an exponential distribution, and it will randomly um, uh, draw a number of samples from an exponential distribution. The more samples we do, the smoother that curve will look, um, because it's taking uh, uh, even more samples. So you, you'll see, essentially, when you come on to do the modeling in SymPy, uh, where you'll be using exponential distributions as one of your distributions, um, that you'll see um, that this is essentially what it's doing. So when you when it selects the time to the next patient arriving, um, essentially it's taking a random sample across along this curve. Um, and so it would pick one of these one of these values as being uh, time in minutes, for example, to to next patient arriving. So it's just a little visual visualization. But I didn't expect you to understand the um, uh, understand the code. Um, did did anybody hear the explanation about the, the what why you couldn't why people were getting errors? Did did, did you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we that, heard that. Okay. So it was just when I started sharing. Okay, that's handy to know. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Let's let's um oh I don't know why I've stopped sharing. I need to carry on. So uh let's let me share again. Okay, right. So you still hear me? <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I better check. Uh right. Let's look at the next bit. So we've looked at um, Spider. Um, you've got a bit of a feel for how that works. And so you get lots of practice using it. But it's just to give you a bit of a, um, an overview, really, of how that, that sort of works. The next thing I'm going to talk about is um, Japita notebooks. Um, now, um, Japita notebooks are um, they're, they're like a document. So it's a bit like um, a, a Word document uh, or a portable document file, PDF. Um, it's, it's, a Jupyter notebook is a, is a type of document. OK, uh, different to a .py file, which is essentially a code file. Um, a Jupyter notebook is a, is a document, um, but it's a very special kind of document because it allows you uh, to run code within that document. So the key aspects of Jupyter notebook are that they're um, an open format. So they're not proprietary. It's not like a, a docx file, which is um, uh, owned by Microsoft and the source code is closed. Uh, it's an open format. Um, they're uh, made up of cells. Um, so you have various cells, and you'll see how that works in a moment. And then basically each cell uh, contains either some narrative text or images, which is known as markdown, um, or a block of Python code that you can execute. OK, so it's a mixture of cells that are some text and or images and um, some code. Um, so uh, let's have a look at them. Um, so I'm going to launch uh, Jupyter. Now you will do it with a Anaconda um, uh, Navigator. Uh, I'm going to do it um, via my 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 prompt. Let's open a new one. So um, there, this is the point at which you may find uh, a few of you may discover uh, firewall issues. Sometimes uh, your IT department has blocked this. If that's the case, just ask them to unblock it. Most last year, most people uh, were able to use this okay. Um, so hopefully it should be fine. Um, but we're going to use um, what's called Jupyter Lab. Now in Anaconda Navigator, you can use um, uh, Jupyter Lab or you can just use the Jupyter Notebook um, facility, which basically just allows you to write and read notebooks. That's got the basic functionality, but Jupyter Lab is better um, because it has added functionality that will, will make it useful if you're actually developing in earnest. Um, so I'm going to launch Jupyter Lab. What will happen is it starts off, it spins up a little server, um, and uh, that server uh, will uh, uh, then uh, run these uh, run these documents. Um, so let me just uh, close that so you'll see what you uh, see when you first open this up. It'll open up in a browser window, um, and uh, along the left here. Uh, depending on where you've opened it, uh, it'll have a file directory. So I've opened it um, whilst being in the um, the folder for this session. Uh, so I've got access to all of that. Um, you may have your entire file system on there. Um, if you open it from Anaconda, I think that's what it does. Um, and then you'll see this launcher on the right um, where you can uh, create a new notebook or a new console. Uh, you won't need most of this. The, the key things that you'll do here are to create a new notebook by clicking this button. Uh, which will use uh, Python 3, that's what we've all hopefully got installed, um, or you'll use the uh, navigator on the left to open an existing notebook, which I'll show you in a moment. So let's imagine we wanted to create a new notebook, so I click on that, um, and you'll see a little cell pops up here. By default, that will be a code cell, um, and you can see it says code there. So I can type in a piece of code, so I can print, print hello. Okay, now if I do that, uh, 
if I click off, you can see that that's, that's some code. Nothing will happen, but I can actually run that piece of code. Uh, and I can do that in two ways. I can either click the little button up here and it'll run it and the output will appear directly below the cell. Uh, or alternatively, uh, and you, what you'll probably find yourself doing as you use this more is uh, hitting uh, control and enter at the same time. That will automatically run that cell. So it does the same as the play button, basically. Um, and so I can change that to hello, Dan. Control and enter, and it'll put the output underneath. So I can write any code in there, um, any Python code, and it uh, we can execute it. But what I can also do with a JPython notebook is I can, rather than having a code cell, I can have a markdown cell. So I just select this drop down menu here, select markdown. Now this now becomes a markdown cell. So I can put some narrative text, okay? Um, so uh, I could put, um, this is a simple piece of code. And if I do the same thing again, push control and enter to run it, you can see it comes off as some narrative text. That's not code, that's just some text. Now this stuff is really useful when you want to create and share some code or indeed for teaching, as you'll see in a moment, um, where you want to have uh, essentially blocks of code and then blocks of text that explain how the code works. Okay, and it's really useful for sharing it with someone that they can then run the code and see what individual bits of the code uh, are doing. Um, now, in the markdown, you can also do uh, other stuff and you'll see some examples in the exercise. I can make that into italics, um, like so, uh, or I can make bits of the uh, code bold, Ooh, like so. I can uh, put in, let's do another new one. Uh, let's do a mark down here um, and let's put in a header. And then I can put little titles in. And there's all sorts of things you can do. And you'll see some examples of that um, in the exercise you're going to do. You have a play around with it. Um, you can also move things around. So let me put in another code block here. Um, and uh, let's just do a simple. So I'm going to print the answer of two plus two. Um, let's say I wanted to do that before I said hello. So I can, if I hover over uh, this little number here, I can left click and I can drag um, and I can move those cells around. So it's really useful for being able to, to do that. Obviously be careful about dragging around code cells um, because you, you there may be things that are, it's dependent on earlier in code. Um, now these little numbers that pop up here basically indicate the order in which you do things. Um, so you can see that's come out four. If I run that cell again, the, the output won't change, um, but it's run that code again. And it's now the fifth thing I've done. And it allows you, because it's really important in the Jupyter notebook, um, because you can run things in any order, you could technically start with the last cell and run that first, that it's important that you, you can track the order in which you run cells and which cells you have and haven't run. So it allows you to keep a track of um, you know the cells that you've run. And you'll see some examples of that as well um, in the exercise. But they're really good ways of um, writing code, but uh, in a way in which you want stuff to be shared and used by other people, because you can write blocks of code um, and then um, uh, um, pieces of narrative text that will explain what's happening and explain the outputs, for example. So it becomes more like a document that you can give to people that, that also has the benefit of allowing them to run the bits of code themselves. And that's enormously powerful. You'll see some examples as well today of, of um, where that can be used, um, but it's a really good, uh, really good thing um, to use. What you don't want to do uh, with the Jupyter notebook is just to have a big block of text in a single cell, uh, sorry, a big block of um, code. Uh, in a single cell that you've copied and pasted from the spider. That's not how you use a uh, Jupyter notebook. It'll allow you to do it, but that's not the best use of it. You're supposed to kind of set, uh, break up your code into chunks um, and have uh, explanatory text and pictures maybe around that that will then allow you to um, explain what each bit is doing and allow the user to run it themselves. Okay, So again, you'll see some real world examples of that um, uh, a bit later when we do the collab thing, um, uh, and you'll, uh, which is very similar, uses this kind of structure, and you'll see some collab examples of that. Okay. Uh, I think I covered everything on that. Yeah, okay. So let's go uh, back into uh, groups. Uh, I suggest you take a 10 minute break first, 
Uh, so take a break till 10 past 11. Then when you go back, uh, I'll open up the rooms now so you can just go straight back into your, your uh, breakout rooms after. Um, you're going to work through um, the uh, example um, Jupyter 1 uh, IPI uh, NB file uh, that you've got uh, in as part of the um, the Git uh, repository for, for this session. Um, and you need to open that within Jupyter Labs. So open Jupyter Lab and then open uh, this uh, uh, um, Jupyter notebook. And the IPI NB is the file format for a Jupyter notebook. Okay. Um, so let me show you how to do that. Uh, where am I? Here we go. So if I go back to um, uh, here, you can see uh, I can open a file as well as creating a new one. Uh, and in I navigate to my folder, which I'm already in, uh, but you'll need to navigate to wherever you've downloaded the stuff for today. And then if I double click uh, that file, the example Jupyter 1, uh, this will appear here. So work through that um, as a group, have a look at it, um, follow the instructions. Once you've done that, and you've, you're all happy with how that works, um, have a go at then creating your own Jupyter notebook. So um, take the little bits of simple code that you've just done in Spider, um, that you wrote as to you know, sort of play, uh, play around with that, um, and put that into a little notebook um, and put some explanatory text around it, um, just to get have a, you know, be creative, just to have a little uh, sample notebook um, and, and do what you like with that. Um, so I'm going to give you 40 minutes for the exercise and 10 minute break now. OK, so we'll break to 10 past 11. Um, so go and stretch your legs, take a break, um, and then we'll resume uh, at uh, about 11.50 uh, for the final uh, the final bit. Uh, as I say, you may find if if you can't get Jupyter Lab working, find someone in your group that is. Um, I'd advise you to do this, uh, all follow along, but I'd advise you to do this bit as a group anyway. OK, let me stop sharing. I'll open up the rooms and uh, go and stretch your legs. Um, and uh, we'll see you shortly. And I'll be floating around um, in a bit uh, if you have um, any problems. Uh, sorry, see some... down. Yeah, uh, can't open lab, only notebook. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> okay um you can do it in notebook um it's not quite as good but you'll 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 have to do it in notebook if that's all it allows you um oh somebody's uh okay that's yep yeah, that's if you do that for the anaconda prompt so if you go into the um start menu i think they still call it start menu on windows sorry um uh and go into find the anaconda prompt um and uh input that command uh, hopefully that will work for you um some of you may find that that will launch it but then when you go to run anything, uh, this is what we had a few times last year, nothing will happen. Um, and that's because IT have blocked it because essentially it's spun up a server that then the um, that you're then connecting to and some IT departments uh, block that by default. Um, so you may have an issue with that. Hopefully though, um, the Jupyter notebook will at least work. Um, so try that. If you can't get lab working, use Jupyter notebook. But if you've got someone in your group for whom uh, they can use Jupyter Lab, then I'd advise um, sh uh, they share their screen. Uh, just seen, sorry, uh, module not uh, I'll come back to you, I'll come back to you on that one. Um, okay, Anaconda prompt sounds like it's working for people. So go and stretch your legs anyway for 10 minutes and then um, have a go and I'll be floating around if you can help. But hopefully at least one of you in the group can run this. When we come to CoLab after, you'll see how you're able to then do everything on CoLab um, that you, if you're having issues with Jupyter Lab, you can do the same thing on CoLab. Okay, uh, see you shortly. Hi everyone. Okay, first of all, uh, I, I'm presuming you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. Good. That's. I'll check again in a minute when I start sharing the screen. Um, excuse me. So, um, yeah. So the uh, it sounds like quite a few of you have got the issues resolved. Some people aren't able to access lab, um, as I suspected, um, because it there'll be a block um, that IT have put on. Um, you will be able, you should be able to use Jupyter Notebook, um, and you'll also should be able to use uh, CoLab, um, which I'll show you next. Um, but and I'll show you how to do that if you're having any issues. But if you are getting the issue where you can't use Jupyter Lab, um, uh, then uh, go back to your IT department they'll, they'll, and, and say that it's it's not working, and also say that it's um, uh, it's it, we think it's it's 
basically blocking that server port um, and they'll be able to resolve well hopefully they resolve that for you if they refuse to do it um you'll have no choice other than to use either Jupyter notebook or um uh, collab but normally um they'll they'll unblock that for you um it's just uh some people i know don't have any issues um other others do um also just say i mean i've put in the uh, put in the tannoy here um let's see some people have already posted um obviously if you are getting continuing to get any issues post them in the uh, one of the public channels either the common room or the, the tannoy um where everybody can see because you may find other people have managed to resolve it and can share ideas um part of the, the this session is a bit of um uh, the first time you're sort of going through and using this software and part of the reason for doing this um is that you're able to um uh, resolve uh, or encounter any any potential problems and try and resolve them um but there will be multiple options for how you can do stuff um so the, the, there will be ways around things um but unfortunately there's there's not a huge amount we can do from our side because you will have problems that are very specific uh, to your particular computer setup um or things that it have done to your computer setup um that won't allow uh, that, that are causing issues um so uh, uh if you can uh, share on on there what what you know people that are having problems or people that had the problem and managed to solve it you hopefully uh, as a group will be able to uh, to solve this um and i see people have already posted a few um ideas um hopefully the spider thing is working i did see somebody's um still struggling that it doesn't seem to be updating so um uh, if anybody else had any issues with that um i see as well quite a bit coming up in the chat and one of the rooms i was in uh, where uh, about net not being able to see network drives um, that seems to be an issue um, and again I, it might be an issue with Windows um, there's no issue uh, so on Jupyter Lab on on my machine I can see but I'm on Linux um, I can see absolutely everything on my computer um, so uh, it's it's likely a combination of uh, Windows file systems and it being um, uh, um, network drives and things like that. It might, if, so again, if people manage to resolve that, uh, a temporary measure is obviously to, to, to put it in somewhere that it can see uh, on the same drive, but by default it should um, uh, allow you to see everything on the drive that where uh, Jupyter has been installed. Um, so uh, perhaps move your HSMA folder to somewhere where it can see and hopefully that should work although a few people i think are having issues with that as well um but it's a good time to kind of uh encounter these issues and and, and iron them out um uh, and it's always tricky when you're dealing with lots of different um configurations uh and where you very often don't have full control over your your laptops um so it, it can be um it can be a bit difficult so if you have got the option of putting it on your personal laptops you may also want to uh, to do that where where possible however i'm also now going to show you uh, google colab which assuming your it department um hasn't blocked you from accessing the website you will all be able to use without any issue um, without having anything installed so this is your your kind of backup and it also has a few little advantages um itself right i'm going to start sharing my screen uh, and then i'll check to make sure you can still hear me after uh, we don't need to share sounds that should be fine okay right can everybody still hear me yeah, yeah. Awesome. Good. That's a good, that's a good start. I, I'm, I'm getting my own sound issues. I think it's, I, I think I know what my sound issues are. Um, and uh, Linux is not without its faults. And there's, unfortunately, there is a, there is a sound bug in the operating system that seems to be causing issues. If all else fails, I'll plug in a second set of speakers um, and then I'll be able to hear you on one of them. And you should be able to hear me uh, on one of the microphones, if nothing else. Okay. So last thing today, we're going to go through um, Google Colab. Now, uh, Google Colab or uh, Colaboratory um, is uh, basically an online platform uh, that's uh, run by Google. And it basically allows you uh, to write and execute uh, Python code from your browser. You don't have to have anything else installed. You don't need to install Python. You don't need to have Anaconda or anything like that uh, in order to use Colab. Anybody can go on to that website um, and and uh, run code and write code. Okay, um, that makes it really useful for people who don't have that software resource. So if you want to share a model with others uh, without having to say you're going to have to install Python in order to do this, they can go on and run that code um, without having anything installed on their computers. That makes it really easy, and it's also obviously quite useful while you're getting software and, uh, issues uh, resolved um, on your own laptops. <coughs> now. Um, 
basically what happens is the uh, the code that is on a um, uh, that you put up there um, is run on uh, Google servers. Um, they've got their own um, uh, computer farms that have their own CPUs, um, uh, rather than locally. Uh, so when you're using Spider and your Python notebook, you're using your own processor. Whereas when you do it on, on Colab, you're using Google's computers and you're connecting to them uh, via the internet. Um, and you also get access um, to uh, GPUs and TPUs. So GPUs being graphical processing units, uh, TPUs are tensor processing units. Um, when we come on to the machine learning, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, and those of you at the open day will have heard me talk a little bit about that. Basically, um, uh, for machine learning applications in particular, um, when you do very big, large scale uh, 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 machine learning neural network problems, um, GPUs are very good at being able to parallel process huge amounts of data at the same time, which is what you need uh, for a neural network. So they can uh, be uh, um, quite beneficial. Um, if you've got a CUDA enabled um, GPU yourself in your desktop, you can use that when we come onto the neural network stuff. And you'll notice uh, as you start to do more complex stuff, there's a huge difference in performance. And you'll see a glimpse of that in a moment in the exercise uh, about how much difference it can actually make for more complex stuff. Um, but it gives you, obviously th that may not be available to all of you. If you've got laptops and you haven't got a CUDA enabled GPU in there, um, then there's no way for you to upgrade that. Um, uh, and so, uh, and also CUDA enabled GPUs are quite expensive uh, very often. You can get slightly cheaper ones, but um, uh, you know, top end ones, you're talking thousands now, unfortunately, especially with, with shortages, although that's getting a bit better. Um, but it is a good excuse if you're, um, if you really want to get into this uh, to, and uh, to go to your, uh, your manager and say, I'm, I'm, I need a new GPU or I need a new computer. And indeed, some of the HSMAs managed to do that last year. Uh, so if you really want to get into the machine learning stuff, um, it could be quite a good excuse to get a new computer. Uh, so give it a give it a try. Um, but Google Colab will allow you to do that. Um, you can as well with Google Colab, although by default, you will be using their, uh, their computer, uh, their CPU resources, etc. Um, you can actually connect locally to your own. So you can use Google Colab but tell it to use your own processor. Um, and that can be an option if you're having issues with um, Jupyter Lab, et cetera, um, but you don't want to have some of the limitations of uh, Colab, which are, so Colab used to be entirely free, but when, uh, just a few years ago, it was entirely free. Uh, it is now free, uh, but you uh, uh, you have a limited, well, you can do everything with the free edition, except you just basically get a very low priority in the queue. Um, and Google are very clear that there is no guarantee as a free user that the service will be available at any time. Now, I've never known it not to be, um, but do bear that in mind because uh, they're trying to get you to pay for it, um, to pay for resources. Um, but you might be a little bit down the list. So you might go to run something and find you're waiting um, because you're waiting for some resources and you're you're down the pecking order because you haven't paid. Um, for the stuff we'll do in the training, it won't be an issue. Um, uh, but if you came on to do this uh, in, in terms of your project work, it may not be the best solution because you can't rely on it to that extent. Um, and it'll also, as we come on to, uh, essentially destroy the session um, after a certain amount of time. And I'll talk more about that uh, in the moment. So basically, Colab um, uses a notebook style format um, that you've uh, you've just seen, uh, very similar to the Jupyter notebooks, um, very similar format where you've got code cells and markdown cells, etc. Um, and you can import, and I'll show you how to do this. So if you, those of you who are having problems at the moment using Jupyter Lab, I'll show you how you can um, import Jupyter notebooks into Colab. Um, so on Tuesday, for example, when we when I say go off and do this in uh, open up this Jupyter notebook, um, if you're having problems with Jupyter Lab, you can choose to use Colab instead and just import that file uh, that you've downloaded from the GitHub repo, import it um, up to Colab, um, and then that will allow you to open it as though you're using um, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab. But Colab's also got its own sort of uh, features and advantages um, uh, as well. Um, so before I go over to uh, Colab, I'll put the link there, but we'll, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, basically, when you start Colab, um, you'll get this little sort of wizard window that pops up and there'll be five tabs. Um, the first tab, um, the one it normally opens on is examples. Um, that's basically got some example notebooks that you can open and have a look at um, that will take you through various features um, of Colab. And it's well worth having a look at that. However, if you are 
um, not already a Python coder, I would advise you wait um, until you've been through a bit of the Python training because it will assume that you know Python. Um, so you're, you, you, you bookmark that for coming back to in a bit um, if you're new to Python. Then we've got recent. Uh, that tab will basically list uh, uh, your most recent files that you've been working on uh, in Colab. If it's the first time that you're opening this up, which for many of you will be, um, you'll just have the welcome to, to Colaboratory uh, notebook uh, in there. But as you start using more, uh, they'll appear here. Um, then you've got Google Drive. These are a list of all the notebooks that you've got stored, um, uh, uploaded to your Google Drive. Uh, GitHub um, tab allows you to import notebooks from a GitHub repository. So um, hopefully what uh, what you're all doing for these sessions is um, uh, following the instructions ahead of the session and downloading um, the stuff you need for that session onto your local hard drive. Um, but what you can also do, uh, and I'll show you in a moment how you upload um, the, the, the notebooks, et cetera, back up to Colab, so you can view them there. Um, but you can just link straight from the GitHub. Um, so you, it allows you to put in the URL, and then you could open, for example, um, the Jupyter notebook that I put up on GitHub in Colab without having to download it first. Um, but I would advise you download all the materials for each session anyway, so that you've got those uh, locally, because you'll be wanting to work with them locally, ultimately anyway. Um, and then the upload tab is exactly what I'm going to show you in a moment, which is where you can then uh, import uh, notebooks from your from your local machine. Um, there's a button down here, new notebook, fairly self-explanatory. That's how you will create a, a brand new uh, uh, Google Colab notebook. So let me oh, let me go over to Google Colab. This will boot up into there, so you can see I've got my um, my recent tab here, which has got the um, sorry, yes, it opens to recent, I think, not examples, um, uh, recent uh, files that I've used. Um, so, uh, but I'm just going to create a new one initially. So if I click new, uh, give it a moment, and then it'll pop up. Now you'll see, uh, so I've got a dark mode enabled, uh, so yours will probably be white by default, but I'll show you how to change that in the, in the exercise. Um, but it's a very similar structure uh, to what you had before. There's just a few slight differences. Um, so uh, here, by default, again, we've got a code block. Oops. So I'll put print hello. Um, now, uh, the play button. Uh, so again, you can push control and enter to run a cell, which is what you'll tend to do as you get more experience with it. Um, but uh, there's also a play button. The play button in Colab is right next to the cell, which I think is quite good, um, rather than at the top. So you can click that. Now, the first time you run uh, a cell in, in uh, Colab, it'll connect um, uh, to uh, one of the uh, resources, uh, one of the CPU uh, CPUs at Google. So it'll take a moment to run the first time. But if you see, so it's then output hello, as much as you'd expect. Um, if I run that again, you'll see it'll happen much more quickly. There you go. So it's come on straight away. Um, and it tells you the time it took to run it. So it was essentially zero seconds, uh, or less than one second um, here. If I want to add a new uh, cell, I can either add a code cell or a text cell, and I just select. So I click text, and that will give me my markdown. Uh, so this is the text. Um, now, what's quite nice about Colab is it gives you a little preview of what it'll look like, uh, what the markdown will look like once it's formatted um, over on the right. Um, so if I put something in bold, so that's a tablet, isn't it? Something in bold. There we go. Um, and you'll see it'll format to bold there. Um, what you can also do um, with uh, with Colab, it's got a few shortcuts up here, which allows you to turn stuff into bold without having to write the markdown um, uh, uh, code. So you can click bold there much as you would in Word or something like that and make it italics, etc. And it'll put the markdown in there for you to do that. Uh, so that's quite handy. Obviously, it doesn't have everything, but it does have quite a bit. Uh, all main The main stuff I showed you about inserting images and uh, uh, having lists, bullet points, um, in um, uh, headers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so with the headers, if I just show you, if you highlight that, uh, click toggle heading. Each time you do it, it'll toggle uh, a different type of heading. It'll start with the most important, uh, and then each time you click it, it'll add a uh, another layer down. So you'll have a big heading, subheading, etc. Um, so that's that's quite useful. It's quite a nice little um, little feature of uh, Colab. And I do like the sort of preview thing. Now, in order, there's a slight difference with Colab. Uh, with Markdown cells, you don't hit Control and Enter or a play button. Uh, you just click off them. Uh, so when you click off the cell, it actually works. 
Why is that not doing anything? There we go. For some reason it wasn't responding. Um, then it'll automatically format your um, your markdown cell. But again, if you want to change it exactly the same you did with Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, double click on it and it'll bring you back to this. But I do like this preview thing. I think that's a really nice feature actually of, um, of Colab. Uh, okay, let me show you some other bits. I put up a little list of things I was going to show you. Oops. So I've shown you adding uh, code and uh, cells and formatting using the cell toolbar. But remember, all of your markdown uh, that you use for a Jupyter Notebook still works. You click off tell, uh, cells to finalize them. You use the play button uh, or control and enter to run code cells, um, but not markdown cells. Um, so let me show you clearing all outputs without restarting runtime. So you can restart runtime uh, if you click on uh, runtime and then restart runtime. And it'll ask you if you're sure. Click yes. This is basically restarting your kernel, but the kernel's up, up on their server uh, by default anyway. And then that will restart everything for you. But it doesn't clear the outputs. So if you go to edit, you can also click uh, clear all outputs at the bottom. Click that and it'll remove all the outputs. Okay, so slightly different uh, to the way you do it for a Jupyter notebook. Um, you can also, there's two different ways in which you can uh, restart the runtime. One is um, in runtime, which is where I tend to do it. Um, the other is if you go to, oh no, that's for something different. Ignore me. Forget I said that. I'll come on to that. Uh, so um, what you can also do, and this is quite a nice little feature, is you can use headers to expand and clap sections. So let's say I want um, to put in a header section, which says uh, section one. Okay, so click off that. Um, now, if I then add some code cells under the, oh, under that, I'm going to the right place, there we go. Now you'll see, I'll just put a little piece of code in there. And run that. Now you'll see here a little arrow has appeared next to the header because I've used a header. What that allows you to do is to automatically be able to allow the user to collapse and expand various sections. And it does that based on headers. So if I click on that, you can you can collapse that bit. And that can be quite useful if you've got sections of your notebook that where you basically want to say, here's some, for those who are interested, here's some further explanation or here's some more uh, deeper code. Um, but you want to keep your notebook um, uh, uh, kind of tidy by default. So it's quite a handy way. So it tells them there's some hidden cells and they can click on that and see what the cells are. Um, but they don't necessarily have to have to go in and, and see it by default. So it's quite a nice little feature, depending on how you how you structure your notebook. Um, the last thing I'm just going to show you before I set you off on the exercise um, is uh, changing the uh, the runtime uh, and the hardware accelerator. So by default, uh, you will be using um, a CPU, so a, a normal processor, um, and that will be on uh, the servers of Google. But I can change that. So uh, this is what I was about to say a moment ago. So there's two ways you can do that. One is in uh, runtime where you can click change runtime type. And the other is if you go to edit and notebook settings, I tend to just do it through runtime because it makes the most sense. Um, so if I click runtime and change runtime type, you'll see by default, it's saying, no, don't use any hardware accelerator. That's the GPU and the TPU, okay? But you can change that. So uh, let's say I'm doing a piece of machine learning and I wanna use the GPU resource. I can click that and I can click save. And you'll see up here, it starts saying connecting and it's reconnecting you now to a, to a, a graphical processing unit, basically a big graphics card um, uh, that, that uh, uh, on one of Google's computers. I'm now connected to a GPU. Now for printing the word hello, you are going to see absolutely no difference whatsoever. GPU is not, and it will warn you that you should only really be using a GPU, which are the resources that people really come to Colab for. Um, to do the machine learning stuff. You should only really do that um, if you're using something that would benefit from it. Um, otherwise, you're just hogging the resource for, for that somebody else could, could find more useful. Um, but when you come on to do machine learning stuff and you get onto the more complex stuff and you want to use Colab, it's quite a, a quite a nice way to do that. So you can use the GPU. And in the exercise you'll do in a moment, um, you can see the benefit. Uh, you get run a little test and it will show you the difference for that kind of uh, that kind of thing. OK, but that's how you change it uh, and change the runtime uh, for that. One thing to say, uh, just to flag up with Google Colab, um, the sessions that run, basically these sessions get destroyed after 12 hours or when you close them down. OK, so that you can save the notebook. The notebook will still be there when you come back, but everything you've processed will not be. 
that does mean so if you got into very big stuff um so some of mike's uh, my colleague mike um does a lot of machine learning around stroke um uh, stroke treatment um some of his models run for days because they're huge okay you can't do that with the free version of colab um you'd set it running 12 hours later it would just stop it would destroy the session and it's gone as though it never happened okay so all the code will be there but it, it stopped the running and it'll it, 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 you'll have to go back to square one um uh so there is where you would if you're getting into that kind of stuff colab's not going to be any good for you and certainly if you're getting into complex stuff that even took a few hours i wouldn't risk it with colab because with the free version because you're getting um essentially uh, a, a very low priority so you may you, you may not get the full benefit or you may be waiting in a queue to use the resource um and so there's a risk that you'd lose it all again um so just be aware of that you can of course pay for colab if you so wish but ideally what you want is a nice setup um locally that you can you can run and control but if that's not an option potentially um colab could be could be an option for you everything we do for the training though you won't run into that even the machine learning stuff you'll start to notice your computers creak a little bit but it won't be anything major uh, you'll still be able to run it in a practical amount of time um but uh, you know we're not going to do anything in the training where you're running a, a piece of code that takes three days to run we're, we're, we won't be doing anything like that okay so let's uh do your final exercise of the day so basically again i'm going to put you back into your groups um i'm gonna i want you to have a read through of the uh, oh sorry i knew i'd forget this i was going to show you how to import a notebook so those of you who are struggling um, in using Jupyter Lab or haven't got the software installed yet uh, on the computer, uh, you can do it like this. So obviously you can see that, that you'd be able to create a new notebook and create some new code. But if I, uh, during the exercises at any point, if I say, uh, follow along with this Jupyter notebook and you haven't got Jupyter installed or um, uh, that you can't access it yet for the, uh, because of the IT issues, um, let me show you how you do it. Uh, so if I go back to, uh, to code, let me just, let me go back to the, the fresh link, uh, which will replicate what you'll see. Here we go. So if I go to um, upload, I can then choose a file. So I'm going to choose file, uh, and then I'll go uh, into wherever I've got my um, uh, file stored. So uh, from wrong oh, HSMA. So for this, I've got it all the way in here. To a so this is for example if you wanted to do the, the the notebook you just looked at in the last exercise i can find it on my computer double click it and it'll upload it to google servers and there you go you can play around as though you're using uh Jupyter lab and that will allow you to to use it in exactly the same way you did before you see all the formatting still works exactly as it did the picture of me still there all of that is exactly as it was before so any of the exercises uh, uh, this is your fallback um, so if you can't get stuff installed yet, or you're having issues with Jupyter Lab, um, I mean, I'd probably recommend using Jupyter Notebook in the first instance, but this is the, uh, the other option that you can use Colab and just uh, upload the, the notebooks that we're going to be using for the training um, and just work on them on Colab. Um, and as I say, nothing on here is going to uh, strain it. So you, 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 the, the fact you've got a lower priority is not going to matter because the, the the stuff you're processing is going to take seconds to process so it's not an issue so that's how you do it if you're uh if you're wanting to um uh if you if you're having uh, issues um yes there's a hand up yeah i've got some issues connecting to, to colab and creating new workbooks so i can view the examples um stack overflow seems to suggest it's a firewall thing so it may not be 100 percent accessible right okay yeah uh, that will be you're gonna need to get it to sort that out <laughs> surely it, yeah it will be a firewall thing um so yeah there's not um that's my that, so basically if you've got if they've blocked everything locally and collab uh functionality then then they're gonna have to unblock something otherwise you won't be able to do anything um so yes uh so hopefully i know some people have had issues um firewall issues with collab not too many but sounds like you're one of them so yeah get onto it it's a very simple thing for them to unblock that sure um, thing. Yeah, they will need to do that unfortunately uh i was just gonna also show you if you're already in collab and you want to open a new notebook um you can click on file and upload notebook there as well and that will take you back here 
Uh, and you can do it just to show you, uh, you can do it via the GitHub link as well. So if you wanted to go and put in the, the path to that file on the GitHub repository, you can do it without downloading it. But as I said, I'd recommend you download your stuff um, so that you've got it all locally as well. Okay, let me stop sharing uh, and I'll get you to go uh, into your uh, your groups now. So basically what I want you to do um, is uh, uh, to uh, go through the um, Colab notebook that I've put. So you'll see it in your uh, in your um, slides. Uh, there's a link that I've put there. Um, sorry, I stopped sharing too soon, didn't I? Let me share again. There we go. Um, so yeah, this link here. So if I click on that one. This will take you directly to a, a, um, one I've got stored on my Google Drive. Um, have a read through that uh, as a group. Do this as a group um, and uh, uh, have a read through. Make sure you're understanding how everything's happened. And at the bottom, you'll see this little demo which compares GPU and CPU. Um, so it'll show you the difference on a complex problem between using a CPU and a GPU, and it'll calculate the difference in time, and it's quite stark. So you'll see how it can be uh, a real advantage having one of those. Um, and then if you've got time, I'm conscious we, we've not got too much time on, on this, but if you've got time uh, or uh, after the session, if you if you don't, have a look at these two models. Um, the first one I've put a link to here um, is a uh, fantastic model that was, um, that's been put up on Colab, free and open source. This is um, a model that one of our HSMAs in HSMA3 uh, developed. It was a GP from North Devon um, and did a fantastic model of a vaccination clinic uh, that can be used by anyone. You can set up your own vaccine vaccination clinic um, uh, and set up all the parameters and how big your car park is and all sorts of things in there. Um, so you can have a little play around with that. Um, and the other one is a model that I developed a few years ago, which I'll be talking about in one of the showcase um, optional so showcase sessions we're doing, the lunchtime showcases, um, which is a, a, a um, uh, end of life. Uh, we did this at the start of the COVID pandemic, uh, an end of life uh, care resourcing uh, model that we worked on um, for some people in Bristol. Uh, looking at uh, modeling the stuff and staff resourcing uh, that's need that was needed during the pandemic. Um, so again, a couple of examples of how you can use um, uh, not just Colab, but how you can use um, the uh, Jupyter notebook um, structure um, for uh, having explanatory text followed by a bit of code to say, okay, this is what this code's going to do. So this is the bits you need to change, etc. Okay, so when you get a chance, have a look at those, uh, even if not during this session, do have a, a check them out uh, in your own time. Okay, I'll open up the breakout rooms, um, have a go at that. Uh, I'll bring you back um, uh, just at 12.30, so in about 15 minutes, um, just to uh, sort of uh, close off. Um, and then uh, I will, after that, I'll see you on Tuesday. So let me open up the breakout rooms now. This meeting is being recorded. Hi everyone. Okay, uh, so uh, I thought I'd bring us back now, and I think most of you sort of pretty much got there. But if you didn't quite manage to um, to get to the end, um, I'd encourage you to have a look, and in fact, have a look back through all of the stuff uh, that you've done today, um, just to refresh yourselves um, ahead of Tuesday. Um, just make sure that you're happy with with uh, the three uh, IDs, particularly if you've had any issues with. Um, accessing any of them um, uh, when when you do get access to them, um, obviously, uh, um, yeah, just just go back through just to refresh yourself. Um, uh, hopefully, you've seen that there are a few alternatives. Um, so, uh, uh, unless you have been uh, uh, spiders not working and you can't use um, uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks or Lab, uh, and they've IT have blocked uh, Colab, in which case I can't help you if they've done all of those things. But hopefully, at least one of them. Uh, you can use to some extent um, uh, and that will uh, allow you to, to proceed for the moment um, but ideally you want um, uh, uh, the spider and something that allows you to, um, uh, to to view notebooks whether that's Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab or Google Colab and those three will allow you to to do that um, so it's really been about, about sort of getting uh, having a bit of a play around and also discovering some of these issues today I do see on Slack that most people seem to be solving this issue now um, the the I don't know why you're getting that uh, error around the um, uh, not finding the module that indicates that the workarounds not bringing across the pack so basically Anaconda is a distribution uh, you can just install Python without it but uh, Anaconda comes with all of the useful stuff 
um, right out the door, things like matplotlib, which is for, for plotting, um, and numpy and pandas, which will be using loads, um, all of that stuff without you having to install it all separately. And it comes with spider, which is nice for the scientific community. So it's, it's, a, it's a bundle of uh, Python stuff. You can install all of that stuff separately. Um, but it, the way it bundles it up um, is is what's useful. Yeah, I'm ready in a minute, Kate. Oh, sorry, I, I thought you were talking to me. Um, so um, yeah, basically, the uh, um, if you're getting any issues like that, where after upgrading the spider, um, and then you then get, and in fact, this this applies to anything um, uh, where you say it says module not found, and then gives the name of the module. If you've imported it uh, correctly, and it's still saying that, that means it's not installed. Uh, and so, uh, and you'll be doing this throughout the course that I'll be telling you to install when we come to SymPy, you'll need to install the SymPy library and you use that um, using the pip install command using the Anaconda prompt. So you basically say, I want to install this package um, and then you can import it and it'll find it. So a good rule of thumb, if, you, if you've got the import statement correct, but it's still saying that it can't find a package like matplotlib, but you know you've imported it and there's no sort of spelling mistakes or anything in there, then try pip install the name of the thing it can't find. And then if it's not installed, it'll then install it, then run the code again, uh, and that will work. But you need to do that from the Anaconda prompt. Um, you'll get used to doing that throughout the throughout the training. Uh, initially, for the first month, you won't be installing anything, but um, the when we come on to SymPy and stuff like that, you will need to, and you'll see in the preparation instructions that I'll post up the week before, I'll ask you to install a package, and I'll explain how you do that, uh, and it's using pip. Uh, so you say pip install. Um, the, the reason you don't, there are thousands and thousands of Python packages. Um, so I've had the question before, why can't you just say pip install wildcard and just have, install everything? Never, ever under any circumstances do that. <laughs> That's extremely bad. Um, so you just install things as you need them because there is there is a huge amount of stuff out there um, in, in Python. Okay, let's uh, let's close off there. As they keep sharing on the the common room, your challenges and successes in in getting this stuff working, uh, because ultimately you'll you'll be able to help each other much more than uh, than I can. Uh, uh, given I don't work for the NHS, I'm not in a I'm not on Windows um, and have completely different computing uh, power. So so uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, mutually get through the issues. Apologies that we had. That issue with spider that i wasn't aware of um this this is an advantage of not upgrading your spider version for years um so those of you on i should have said if you're on an older version of spider older than 5.15 don't upgrade you're fine as long as that code 2 thing works then you're okay to um uh, but it's only if you're you are on 5.15 you're going to need to get off uh, uh an upgrade out of it you can downgrade as well but it's a bit more complicated Okay, so thanks everyone for coming on today, um, and I look forward uh, to seeing you on Tuesday, uh, where you'll have your first of three uh, Python programming sessions, and you'll get some hands-on time uh, doing some coding. Um, so uh, hopefully you've had a nice taste of it today. The uh, recording should be up. I'm hoping to get it up later today. As soon as it comes through for processing, I'll start uploading to YouTube. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. See you thanks. again. Thank Bye. you. See you next Thank week. Thank you.